John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. This can be found on pages 1089 in the Church Bibles. John's Gospel, chapter 20, beginning verse 19. Jesus appears to his disciples. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Good evening. We all right? It is morning. I like doing that, sorry. Sometimes I'll say good morning in the evening. Just keep you on your toes, that way I know you're listening, all right? Um, interestingly, <clears throat> I'm not really going to touch on Thomas, the whole account, really, at that point, but as John was reading, I was just reflecting, so I'll say it because I feel like it was on my heart, that actually what was interesting about Thomas is um, he said what he needed from Jesus, and Jesus actually heard him, and a week later returned and gave him what he needed for him to believe, which I find really interesting. And secondarily, he had to wait for it. Isn't that interesting? So Jesus arrived and said, look, you needed this, so here it is. But he didn't get it immediately, he waited for it. A whole week. So that was, I was thinking, that's such an interesting thing from Thomas. But we're not touching Thomas, so unlucky. Um, this morning we're going to speak primarily on the first four, or well, first Five verses of the passage, but before I properly kick in, I, um, I was reflecting on Easter uh, the past week, and um, I'm always caught off guard by, um, by the emotion that is invoked by the in-between stages of Easter. Um, the churches that I've been in in the past haven't necessarily fully immersed themselves in the whole of Holy Week, almost journeying through with Jesus, and what I found was that actually slowing down and joining in on Thursday, the sorrow of Friday, I thought, what is going on here? I don't know if, like, I just don't feel sad because Sunday's coming. That was always my perspective. But actually, as I slowed down, I realised, I was thinking, this, there must be something to it. And actually, I don't know if you noticed, but Easter week, the weather was flipping all over the place, as it seems to be at the moment. It was warm, then it was rainy, then it was not rainy but cold, but it was kind of warm, but then... So you're like, what is going on? I couldn't figure it out. We were in and in between. It's almost as if winter is passing and summer is coming. We were kind of found in this in-between. And spring holds this tension of the, the, the sorrow of winter is leaving and the joy of summer is coming, yet there's still something to be found in spring. There's like new life in spring, isn't there? And there's actually such a real fruit in slowing down, 
remembering the sorrow of the Thursday and the Friday in anticipation for the Sunday. And in a strange way, we're still in an anticipatory place because Jesus is yet to come back again. And there is that tension we hold. And we meet the disciples in this passage in that place So let's pray, and um, we'll see what God wants to say to us this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as we look back to when you met with the disciples those first times, we just ask, would you meet with us again this morning? Reveal your goodness, your peace to us. Thank you for the sacrifice that you made. Help us to never forget the significance of those events. And we just ask this morning, would your presence fill us afresh? You are welcome in this place. Would you fill me as I come to bring something? And I ask that would you just take away anything that's of me, Lord. If anything is not of you, you don't want people to hear. You don't need them to remember. Just take it away. Blow it away with the wind. And as there are things of you, Lord, I ask that you would stick them in the hearts and minds of those people. Fill us all afresh this morning. Uh, all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, we're focusing on the first five verses. So if you've come for Thomas, I'm sorry. But I do want to encourage you, there is a lot in this passage. And actually, in your time this week, you might have a quiet time. I encourage you to reread these passages and see if actually God wants to bring something else to your attention. But this morning we focus on the first visitation of Jesus to his disciples. And this passage between the verses of 19 and 23 can be split into two subdivisions. 19 to 20 are the actual appearance of Christ. And 21 to 23 are a commissioning, a commission, the commissioning of the disciples by Christ. And this morning I want to split those two further because I love points and it's good for you to, oh, that's that point, that's that point. Okay, so we're going to have four main parts. The first part, peace be with you. The second, there is new life in Christ. The third, the Holy Spirit sustains new life. And the fourth, we must go. So the the section starts... Um, by identifying that the disciples are gathered. And I don't know how you imagine this scene, um, but I'm sure it's likely that actually as they gathered, it wasn't just the 12. So sometimes I think it was just a tiny room and they were all sort of huddled. But actually, there's reason to believe that it was more than just the 11 or, or the 12 that were gathered there, that actually there was a general gathering of Jesus' disciples in this room. And they've just seen their apparent... Messiah, the Saviour, the one who's come to change their lives, transform them, rescue them from the turmoil they're in. Well, they've just seen him, like, die with, with, like, no doubt. Like, there's no doubt. The Romans were good at killing people. There's no doubt in their mind he's dead. They locked him in a tomb. And furthermore, the Jewish leaders haven't stopped at that. They, they want to eradicate the notion of Jesus as the Messiah. So they persecute the people that claim to be his followers. So as we encounter these disciples, they have heard a whisper that Jesus might be back. But this passage says that they are hiding and they are in fear and they've locked the doors so that no one can get in. And John here, as he writes, intentionally adds for the fear of the Jews. This is important to the John, John's audience to whom received the Testament, who were regularly in conflict with the Jewish authorities, the readers of this gospel would have been very familiar with the feeling that the disciples were feeling in that moment. But then all of a sudden, Jesus appears in the room. I think John does this at a disjustice, in my opinion. this This is crazy. This is ridiculous, right? This is insane. The doors are closed, and he's like, oh... He came and stood among them. I'd be like, whoa, bang, Jesus came. It was a miracle. The doors were locked. It was was craziness. Some of us started crying. It was, was, do you know what I mean? There's there's none of that. And he stood among them and said, peace be with you. I think, come on, John. A bit more more, uh, passion there for me, but that's, that's just me. But 
<laughs> but he just came and he stood. What's important and very intentional of John is as he enters the room, his statement, his first greeting to the disciples, his peace be with you. Now this greeting, very common in the context. And so some might say, you know, what else was he going to say? And actually, normally when you would meet a fellow, you know, believer, you'd say, oh, peace be with you. But actually, this, this greeting had a secondary function in John here. It was to compound those statements of fear that John was talking about in, the, in, in verse 19. These guys are not joyful right now. They're not looking forward to what life has in store. They are in fear, fear that has caused them to run and hide. But also it fulfills a promise that Jesus had made to the disciples earlier in Luke. So in Luke 14, verses 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave you, my peace I give to you. A gift of peace to the disciples who were fearful of what might happen to them if the Jewish authorities found them. And a gift of peace to those receiving the gospel, a community that was experiencing persecution daily. Jesus' words to the disciples, and specifically John's inclusion of those words here, are a reminder to the readers that they need not fear when they face opposition, that when they face persecution from the Jewish authorities, but actually they can approach these things with the peace of Christ. After saying this, he shows them his wounds, and they recognise him as Lord, it says in verse 20. The revelation of Christ resurrected, filled them with such joy. And I wonder if we still feel that joy today when we consider the resurrection. When we realise who Jesus is for us, do we still have that joy? Then in verse 21, we see again the phrase, peace be with you. And As he makes this statement, he starts the next passage of a commissioning. Receive me in peace and go out in my peace. As the Father sends me, I am sending you. So we've seen his appearance, we enter into the commission. Jesus here is passing on the baton of his ministry. He's saying to the disciples, go. In verse 22, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. I find this passage, this bit quite exciting. When Jesus breathes on the disciples, the word used by John I'm not Greek, is emphiseo, I'm going to say. Feel free to Google and prove me wrong, I don't mind. It only appears once in the New Testament, and that is here. The usage of this word, uh, one of the commentaries that I was reading says it evokes the same feeling, the same description of when God first breathed life into humanity in the first creation narrative. This new life is a sign of a new covenant, the new creation New life in Christ defined not by slavery to sin, bound to a legalistic conscription to an unachievable moral code or law, but a new life that's defined by resurrection life and freedom. This act, this breath, breathed new life into humanity as the first breath in Genesis breathed life. We were entrusted in Genesis with creation. Sadly, we failed. But in the work of Christ, it is to bring about the new creation. And here is Christ choosing to entrust humanity again with new creation. The vehicle of new creation under the lordship of Christ is his church. And it is powered by the Spirit. The second half of Jesus' statements here are interesting. So the, last, the next bit... Um, after this verse, I think... Oh, we're not... Sorry, wrong one. Uh, it's where Jesus says, um, he who forgives his sins will be forgiven. So I think it's verse 23 or 22, if you pop it up. This second half of his commissioning statement I found very difficult to understand at first. Um, but I want to be clear that I, think, I don't think this passage is likely to be a justification for the human capability to forgive the sins of others on a salvific level, in that sense. You can't absolve people of their wrongdoing in the same way Christ can. Often this passage has been used to justify the salvific capabilities of rites and rituals. But 
in terms of moral and behavioural sin, only Christ can put us right and make us holy. However, it says what it says. So, you know, what does that, what does it mean? There we go. That's all I'm, no, I'm going to hopefully bring some light to it. The commentary I was using stated that a helpful way to look at this statement is actually within the context of the author who's writing it. For John, in his gospel, often when he's talking about sin, it is expressed more as a theological failing rather than a moral or behavioural transgression. For John, to sin is to be blind of the uh, to be blind to the revelation of God in Christ. Jesus brings people to judgment by his revealing work and his presence in the world. So Jesus here is commissioning the community to continue that work of making God in Jesus known to the world. And this will in hand bring the world to a moment of decision and judgment about sin. If you tell them, then they will have the chance to be forgiven. And if you don't, they might not. That is how I found it helpful to understand that particular section. So, well, well done. You've made it. We did it. We got there. That's the meaty bit. That's the, the, the sort of thick meat and the bones. Okay. There's only five verses as well. There's, more, there's plenty more. We I thought I've got to stop there. Um, so what can we take from this passage and this story into our lives? So that's great. There's some Greek there. There's some random understanding from some book you read. But what do we do with our actual lives, Joel, right? Well, I'll take you back to our first point that I said. Peace be with you. The first words to enter the disciples' ears also mirrors that of the first witnesses to the tomb. Don't be afraid. Peace be with you. The fundamental principle of the message of Jesus Christ is one of peace. And as mentioned before, Jesus offers peace as a gift to his followers. In Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, we are told that the peace of God will surpass all of our comprehension and all of our understandings and will guard our hearts and minds through Jesus. This gift of peace that Jesus gave to the disciples the peace in which he announces his resurrection to the disciples is the same peace that we can have today. Psalm 23, bit of a classic, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. These statements that are throughout the Bible are a fundamental truth that we live with today and it's what sustains us and keeps us going. We are not promised a life of sunshine and rainbows. When Jesus arrived to the disciples, fearful of their lives, he didn't go, don't worry, guys, I'll kill them all. I'll get rid of all your problems for you. We'll be fine. It's not what he does. It's not what he says. He says, peace be with you. We should expect to come across hard times and trials in life, but we can approach these things with the peace of God. So my hope this morning for you is that we get a renewed sense of this peace. That it's not from ourselves, but it's from the presence of Christ in our lives. And when we share this peace, we, we did it before. We're not just, you know, a nice polite way of being friendly to each other in church. Maybe you've seen someone you've not seen for a while. We're invoking the same promise that Jesus made his first disciples to the person that you're looking at, the eyes that you're locked with as you shake that hand. We're praying that the peace of God would guard their hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. That is a, that's a really amazing thing to pray for people. So I encourage you next time we're doing that to really consider what it is that we're saying to that person. So point one, peace be with you. There is new life in Christ, point two. The disciples saw and heard Jesus and they saw who he was, that he was in fact risen from the dead, confirming to them, hang on a minute, he was the Messiah. He is Lord. After they acknowledge his presence, his existence, and his lordship, they receive another gift, new life. He breathes on them. After they declare him as Lord, they receive new life. They are made into a new creation. We spoke about this a lot in the evenings. But you don't meet Christ as a new creation. You encounter Christ. 
you accept him as your Lord, then you receive the breath of God, the Ruach of God, and new life is breathed into you. Here's the kicker. And this bit, I actually struggle with here, so I am like, come on, Joel, fix up, look sharp. We should begin to look different, sound different, act different, and actually sound like a new creation. We should be perceivably new. If we follow Christ, but continue in the same ways as we did before encountering Christ, we have to ask ourselves, and again, don't forget, we're talking to myself here as well, if we have truly accepted the new life that God is giving us. Because it's a relational experience and exercise. We must follow the Lord. We must allow the Lord to work out in our heart and make us a new creation. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to completely exposit the whole of Galatians because it's in there. That's what we did in the evenings. But I encourage you, if you're thinking, what does that mean? What does new life mean? It's on YouTube. There's been some great sermons over that series in the evenings. Do check those sermons out. But I wanted to bring a bit of myself into this so we're not just listening to my boring words. Micah has been a revelation of the chaos of life, but also the wonder of life the love of God. But what's really been funny recently is he's growing, he's nearly six months. He's actually started to copy me. It's a worrying thought. Some of you are thinking, oh no, right? And I play this silly game um, where I lift him up very high because he loves that. And I start to like just pull him in really quickly, like really excited, silly faces. He's up there, I'm like, whoa, and then bang, bring him in. And he, he like nuzzles in, tries to eat my shoulder. It's all chaos. It's good fun. And he does it back because he knows. We hold him up there and he can see on his face, he's like, I know what's coming, I'm ready. And when I let him fall into my arms in a controlled manner, when, um, I pretend to like, eat his face, all of that. So when Lottie was home with him, um, sh- uh, she was looking after him and she found that she, he would do the same thing to her whenever he wanted to play. So like, she would either hold him up and he'd like, oh, and then he'd like, bah! And he'd like jump at her and try and eat her shoulder and all that. Very cute. But she was like, hang on a minute. I've, we've never done this before. What do you think you're doing here, sir? Eating me like that. But Micah, even in his infancy, has begin, began to copy me, which again is a scary thought. Um, <laughs> even at six months old, Micah sees what his father is doing and begins to imitate it. It's very corny. Some of you just went, oh, flip your neck. But when we spend time with the Father, we begin to imitate his ways. Which concludes this second point. Those who believe in Christ receive new life as children of God. And then into the third point, the Holy Spirit is breathed into them. And that is what sustains this new life. The Spirit is what sustains new life, point three. See how we did that? That's magic, isn't it? Right, this is a brief point, hopefully. Um, So I don't want to repeat myself too much, but the Holy Spirit is the sustaining force that enables us to follow Jesus. We We cannot do anything on our own. We require the breath of God in our lives to live lives that are fruitful and are worthy of our calling. We must be sustained by the presence of God. So how do we attain it? When we give our lives to Christ, we receive the gift. That sounds easy, doesn't it? So all you have to do, all you need to do, is give your life to Jesus, and he will give you this gift. You think, well, that's easy then. I'll be perfect after that, surely. Just just crack on then. That's not true. I've used this analogy before. Again, a bit of me. Pretty funny. Um, I pay to go to a gym. Often that doesn't look like me actually going to the gym, but I do pay, so that's good. So obviously, because I've paid to the gym, they give me access to the gym. They grant me access to the gym. But if I think that this membership alone will enable me to see positive change in my body and lifestyle, you'd think I was a bit silly. For words, want for better words, right? It's a participatory thing. I have to exercise, I have to actually go, I have to attend, I have to work hard, sadly I have to sweat a little bit, and maybe it might hurt for a few days afterwards, particularly if that break between visits is a bit too long, right? (laughs) It's true. Sometimes you'll see me like that, oh, flipping it. I have to exercise and it will hurt. Interestingly, pain is part of the growing process when it comes to the gym. And I find that the Spirit of God 
grants us access to new life, but we need to actually commune to be with the Spirit. We have to spend time alone with God in his presence, with his Spirit. Then we will be challenged to grow. When I said this again in the evening, so I don't know if it's because I've done a lot of evening services or maybe we've just done Easter, but actually, when trials come our way, we must approach it with the peace of God because we know that it's going to transform us more closely into the likeness of Christ, right? It's a relationship, not a transaction. And I say this to myself as well, but some of us need to, in fact, definitely to me, some of us need to reconnect with the Spirit of God so that we can be transformed anew. I know I do. So point three, the Spirit sustains our new life. So what of it? What do we do with this new life? We've got it, that's good. We feel good about ourselves. Happy days, Jesus is with us. No, we must go. The last point, and when Jesus showed up to his disciples, he didn't just say, look, stay here, tell no one. Make sure whatever you do, you keep comfortable, make yourselves at home. Joy has filled you now, so you can just sit here and be happy together. Don't unlock the doors. Right? It doesn't say that. Jesus said, as the Father is sending me, I am sending you. The Father sent Jesus to a life of service, of washing feet, of advocating for the poor, of healing the sick, of speaking, heart, speaking out on behalf of the low in society, breaking social convention to communicate the love of God to every single human being that wanted to hear it, and some who just came along for the ride. He sacrificed his time for people, he sacrificed his comfort for people, and ultimately he sacrificed his life for people. So as the Father sends me, Jesus said, I'm sending you. It's a bigger, bigger ask than just, you know, be happy and clappy, isn't it? Jesus commissioned the disciples to follow Jesus. And he is commission, he's commissioning you two to do that. You, you, you who have given your life to Jesus are also the disciples. As we read this, we are receiving the same thing that Jesus is. So we have been given the challenge, the gift the joy, the hardship, the struggle of continuing the work of his ministry on earth. As I said before, Jesus gave us new life, defined by the peace of God, sustained by the Spirit, so we might be transformed, so that we can show the world the truth of who God is, as it is revealed in Christ Jesus. We have to go. We can't just sit in fancy buildings each week, singing nice songs, because if that's all we do, we are not honouring what Jesus has called us to do. They are great. Worshipping in a community is vastly important, so amazing. And I encourage you to keep doing that. But if we don't continue to take the message of Christ into the world, then ultimately we are not doing what Jesus has asked us to do. Now, will our salvation disappear if we crack on just as we are? No. But if we take our salvation seriously, we will be compelled to tell the world. And it doesn't look... Like, we have to go to the far-flung corners of the globe. People need Jesus right here and right now. The children of Jersey need Jesus. The young adults of Jersey need Jesus. The young people of Jersey need Jesus. The families of Jersey need Jesus. Their parents need Jesus. The single professionals who work in finance, they need Jesus. And this might look like stepping into ministry at church, as we mentioned before. It might look like sharing your faith with your friends. It might look like inviting a colleague to a faith event or a, or a church event. The church must be a proactive force for positive change in the world. And I said we need to start outside our front door. I'll end here with a brief summary of what I think God was trying to communicate to me, but also hopefully you, through this passage. Firstly, peace be with you. God's kingdom is revealed in Christ Jesus, is one that is defined by peace. That Christ in our lives will lead to new creation. That We are transformed by the presence of Christ in our lives. Thirdly, our lives are sustained by the power of the Holy Spirit, which requires us to participate in our own transformation. And fourthly and finally, all these things must lead us as the church to continue the ministry of Christ to the world. As Jesus commanded us, we must go. 
into the world, armed with the good news of Christ, filled with the power of the Spirit, into this broken world, just like Jesus did, carrying hope. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you sent your Son. Thank you that even in the midst of the twelve or the disciples that saw you, heard you, heard you were going to do what you were going to do, thank you that we saw in them what we see in ourselves, that actually sometimes we just want to hide. We're scared, we're fearful, we're not sure. But Lord, thank you that you revealed yourself to them, that you raised, your, you raised to new life and you raised us to new life. Lord, as you revealed yourself to them, I ask that you'd reveal to us afresh this morning your goodness, your glory. Thank you that you are risen and that you do give us your peace, that you give us your power, that you give us your spirit. And God, help us to go into the world armed with this great news, this gospel news of your goodness so that they might receive the hope we once received. Fill us with joy, fill us with your peace, fill us with your power. In Jesus' name, amen.